Hi, welcome everyone to IAS Thursday, the last IAS Thursday for the month of March. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study and a faculty member in the program in the history of science, technology, and medicine. Uh, for those of you who may not be able to see me on Zoom, I'm also a 60-ish woman with glasses and uh, wearing clothes appropriate to Minnesota's uh, sudden reversal of spring. Uh, the IAS Thursdays is intended to bring ideas, conversations, and viewpoints from a wide range of scholars to the heart of the university, and in turn, um, to, to be an opportunity for scholars from all walks of life to gather. I want to acknowledge that wherever you are joining us from today, we are all located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus resides on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The Institute for Advanced Study acknowledges that this place has a complex and layered history. A land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land, our relationships with it and with each other. The Institute for Advanced Study is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So next week, I have a few announcements. Next week is the final Spotlight Series event of the academic year. Please join us in person in Northrop uh, in the Best Buy Theater or online for a program titled Unpacking the Middle on the role of American moderates in today's political discourse. And the Mellon Foundation, please note their new logo in the upper right hand corner, uh, has issued a new quote call for concepts focusing on the areas of civic engagement and voting rights, race, race and racialization in the United States, social justice and the literary imagination. And the IES and the College of Liberal Arts are hosting an information session for University of Minnesota potential applicants tomorrow afternoon, that's Friday, April 1st, from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Time via Zoom. Those who are unable to attend, but who are interested in applying can send an email to IAS at umn.edu to receive a recording and to let us know of your interest. If you want to hear more about opportunities and events like these, sign up for the IAS newsletter. You can visit our website to sign up or online attendees right now can check the chat for a link for signing up. And with that, I will move to the um, uh, ubiquitous Zoom instructions. So we have an enabled Zoom's auto transcript um, and captions function for today. To enable the, uh, the captions, click on the live transcript button uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, it's in your Zoom menu bar. If you're on a laptop or desktop computer, it's in the upper right-hand corner uh, if you're on a mobile device. Then select show subtitles. We will have time for audience questions at the end of, of our presentation today. And you can enter those questions at any time during the presentation using the little double balloon Q&A box, also in your Zoom menu bar. Uh, and, uh, and, and we encourage you to put your questions there. The chat feature is also um, enabled, but use that if you um, want to introduce yourself, um, you know, share resources or make comments to each other, but questions go in the Q&A box, uh, comments uh, or introductions or resources in the chat feature. Okay. That's all of the uh, all of the the detail for uh, instructions. And now I want to acknowledge that today's presentation is a partnership between the Human and the Data Initiative, the University of Minnesota's 
Human in the Data Initiative focuses on the ubiquity of big data, algorithmic decision making, and obviously pigeons in every major sector of our world. Human in the Data series events are pre presented by the Institute for Advanced Study, the Digital Arts, Sciences, and Humanities Program, the University of Minnesota Informatics Institute, and Research Computing. And so without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce today's esteemed guest, Dr. Helga Tawilsuri. Dr. Tawilsuri is an associate professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communications and the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University. Her work deals with spatiality, technology and politics in the Middle East with a particular focus on contemporary life in Palestine, Israel. Professor Tawil Suri is interested in how media technologies and infrastructures function as bordering mechanisms and conversely, how territorial and physical boundaries or objects function as cultural and mediated spaces. Much of her published academic work has been about Palestine Palestinian immobility, mobility, and infrastructure, which has taken checkpoints, mobile phones, and internet, film, and questions of borders and space as its focal points. She has also written about Arab media, identification cards, surveillance, video games, and other topics. Professor Tawil Suri is co-editor of Gaza as Metaphor and has published in journals including Kiparl, Social Texts, Cultural Anthropology, Political Geography, the Journal of Palestinian Studies, Arab Studies Quarterly, and many others. She serves on the board of Social Text and Public Culture. So thank you um, so much for, for being here virtually. And I'm turning the program over to you now, um, Helga Tawilsuri. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, the IAS, the Human and Data Initiative, uh, the Minnesota Critical Futures Research Collective, and everybody else that's been involved in that. Um, and also thanks for everybody who's actually joining. Um, so it's not April 1st, but and and I'm just say, saying that because I also just want you to know that my talk is not quite an April Fool's joke. Um, although some people sometimes think it is a bit, it, it is a bit of a joke. Nonetheless, um, what I will be talking about is actually quite serious, even though if at the same time, it is also, uh, it is, Oh gosh, it is it is also uh, uh, sorry, I, I just lost stuff, just lost something. Um, the talk is both serious, but also at the same time uh, a little bit playful, as you'll no doubt uh, gather. Okay. I'm just gonna share my screen. I am indeed going to be talking about pigeons. Um, and across the West, I recognize that pigeons are, have become this kind of reviled scourge, referred to as rats, uh, rats with wings, cockroaches of the sky, trash birds, even public enemy number one. Their hatred is perhaps only rivaled by their seeming ubiquity, particularly in dense urban centers. So it's actually difficult for me to think of a place like Piazza San Marco in Venice or London's Trafalgar Square or uh, New York City's Washington Square without the abundance of pigeons in those places. But pigeons, humans, and cities have a long and intertwined history. So first, um, urban pigeons are feral birds. They are descendant from stock doves deliberately bred by humans for racing, for homing, uh, for eating and all kinds of other purposes. So the pigeons that we see today are really just sort of the remnants of, um, or, or not the remnants, but they've kind of remained in the cities from the very early days of domestication. Cities may have developed and urban residents may no longer rely or want the birds, but the pigeons haven't gone anywhere else since. Second, genetically and temperamentally, pigeons have really been shaped into the kinds of birds that they've become by the deliberate human intention. 
Pigeons have continued to survive, for example, either by scavenging in urban areas or in places where humans have chosen to feed them. And so the, the sheer number of pigeons in places like Venice or London or New York, and unfortunately I've never been to Minnesota, but I somehow am sure you guys have pigeons too. Um, but the sheer number of pigeons in these places uh, speaks to the fact that, pig that the pigeon population is actually an accumulative outcome derived from the compounded actions of a large number of different people over a, a sustained time scale. And it's precisely because, uh, or is precisely uh, pigeons' history with human machinations, and especially with human urban spaces, that is of most interest of me today. Precisely because pigeons live so entangled with humans that they provide insight into the biopolitical impacts of human atmospheric engineering, or if one prefers, the Anthropocene. The pigeon for me is kind of this prime position from which to assess human relations with animals and the larger environment, as well as technological and urban development and growth. Moreover, I, you know, I think it's really important to recognize that it's really in the urban context where any meaningful ecological impact derived from the changes uh, of, uh, that our socio-technical uh, te socio -technical behaviors may and should occur. More than half of the world's population is urban and the number and the percentage is only growing. So many of our global environmental solutions often ignore the urban origin of the planetary problems that we create and that we're attempting to solve. So paradoxically, conservation and sustainability increasingly depend on urban dwellers. This dilemma actually has a name and it's called the pigeon paradox. And it's described in the following way. Under the status quo, a great deal of uh, future conservation will rely in part on our interactions with urban ecosystems and the organisms, including non-natives such as feral pigeons, that call them home. The paradox lies in the dependence of conservation action worldwide on people's direct experiences with urban nature. So ecological conservation is not simply something that happens in nature reserves, protected forests, kind of designated wilderness or green areas, but really wherever and everywhere human lives and livelihoods are entangled with, and especially where they threaten the lives and livelihoods of other kind. So glo global conservation really starts in the middle of Trafalgar Square or in the middle of Piazza San Marco or in the middle of Gaza City's Central Square. And um, diverse kind of efforts to think about environmental and ecological issues alongside human and urban needs is demonstrated often in projects that focus on green projects or resilient cities, conservation development, and so on. But this is equally echoed in languages that speak of hybrids, of becomings, of clinging, cyborgs, becoming withs, striking, strikings back, dances of agency, networks, meshworks, nature cultures, and the list goes on and on and on. In short, the internet pigeon is actually imagined in, in a similar, similar spirit. It's really about the way in we, which, when, the way in which we approach the fluid and constituting relationships of technologies, texts, sorry, that's supposed to say texts, not tests, um, texts, histories, wastes, flows, policies, communities, and materialities. So the IPN is here to demonstrate that our current technological reliance and condition do not inevitably have to lead us to deeper excesses and dependencies, but can instead, by acknowledging our entanglements, help us and imagine a create and create a world otherwise. So the Internet Pigeon Network is really a proposal for a practical solution for a community organized, affordable, resilient, and sovereign internet infrastructure for the Gaza Strip, to, which relies on pigeons for data transfer. The revival and redesign of a pigeon network solves innumerable political, economic, geographic, and technical limitations, but it also makes possible intelligent communication network conditions that are not available in existing new technologies. So the Internet Pigeon Network is equally a meditation on reimagining technological infrastructures in the context of political, economic, and ecological concerns that are really planetary in scale. The solution is not simply specific to Gaza, it is also generalizable in many different contexts and conditions. 
And that's because the IPN is really a prototype or a commentary. It's both a model and a critique. It is ultimately speculative. There is no such thing as an IPN. I don't necessarily intend to build an IPN. So it's really more a kind of exercise in, in thought that I'm, that I'm uh, sharing with you. Um, so it's speculative in that it proposes a redesign of an old technology as a means of revealing possibilities for different infrastructures and infrastructural efficiencies. Its ambition ultimately is to think towards an infrastructural ecology. So before I go on, let me just sort of share with you the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to actually get into details uh, about pigeons. Then I'm going to detail some of the conditions in Gaza and then the IPN prototype. And then I'll move on to discuss the significance of the IPN in terms of mobility before kind of wrapping up in terms, uh, before wrapping up thinking about how this, how this speaks to something called infrastructural um, ecology. So that's kind of the plan for today. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time sort of detailing the prototype of the IPN. I've actually sort of for real thought it out and measured and calculated and so on. And, and I, I have those numbers if you're interested. But I really thought it'd be sort of more useful for you, but also sort of more useful for me to really be talking about the sort of conceptual parts of this. Right. And so I'll also just say that I haven't ever done this as a talk. Uh, so I really appreciate you kind of listening to my not quite April Fool's joke. Um, the pigeon is multifaceted and has multifaceted relations with humans. Throughout history, pigeons have existed as spies, as racers, urban neighbors, scientific objects, gender assistants, messengers, imperial invaders, native species, pets, carriers, drug smugglers, art experiments, and also here the list goes on. Um, pigeons' navigational abilities have equally contributed to innovations in behavioral science and military aerial technologies and aerospace optimization, GPS ma mapping, new mathematical formulas, and also AI. But a particularly fruitful foundation in, deliber in deliberating human-animal co-engineering is not so much in the various ways that pigeons have been used, but it's in dealing it's it's in contending with work that deals with how animal ecologies are rendered into infrastructure. This includes, for example, a number of studies that are kind of currently going on. So looking at uh, animals as labor and animals as mediatic sensors, animals as cyborg assistants. And we see this in, the, in, in different studies, for example, about the large scale deployment of black soldier flies and waste disposal, or here in New York City, um, the metabolic activities of oysters to absorb and diffract the energy of waves. Um, so some of these are sort of different examples of how animals, but also sometimes their metabolisms are relied upon to carry infrastructural work. But they also illustrate ways that animal labor is recruited into techno-political techno imaginaries of what we imagine as this kind of automated, green, sustainable, smart uh, future or city. So taking up the notion of animals as infrastructure, though, really helps conceptualize a wider infrastructural ontology and ecology. One that sees infrastructures as emergent, continually folded into interactions with more than human company. One that locates infrastructuring as a continuous negotiation of the nature infrastructure boundary where natural and infrastructural ecologies meld, but also where infrastructures can revert back to nature. It's also a way to understand to, or, or it's also a way to sort of conceptualize where understandings of infrastructural improvisation, subtending everyday lives amidst precariousness is open to more than human collaborations. A wider ontology in, in short reworks the very notion of the infrastructural. But I really want to stress that the IPN and the way that I sort of conceive of it is, is seeks to kind of combine the human animal environmental collaborative work. So I don't really want us to approach animals as like distant or distaste, distasteful uh, workers. The IPN pigeon human relationship is not really conventional in that sense. It's um, it moves beyond 
pre-existing categories. The pigeons are not assumed to be workers or laborers or pets, neither are they livestock or zoo animals or wild animals or even lab animals. And the humans that are living with the pigeons are not trainers, zookeepers, vets, lab personnel, or farmers. Instead, they're actually a little more akin to what Donna Haraway describes um, in one of her works in which she's, she's kind of elaborating on a particular on a particular kind of art piece about uh, racing pigeons in which she says, it's not the animal alone, nor the practice alone, but the activation of two becoming withs that are written explicitly, explicitly into the project, the project that she's uh, speaking about. So that what is kind of brought into existence is not just simply a pigeon that is transformed by man, nor simply a, a pigeon fancier that transforms a pigeon into a, a racing pigeon, but something else kind of altogether. Um, so relations between pigeons and people are really activations of becoming withs, as she says. Um, so pigeon human shared lives can produce something new. The relationship is imagined as dynamic, as productive, as mutual, a relationship that can perhaps disrupt and set the stage for other configurations. And so it is to the abilities of first pigeons, second pigeon flocks, and third pigeon towers that I will just sort of quickly consider now um, and to speak about kind of the pigeons infrastructurality um, and how and or how pigeons infrastructurality can reconfigure how we may think about communication networks. Pigeons have an impressive visual memory and an acute sense of self-awareness. They remember and they self-recognize. In so doing, they could contribute to the IPN positionality and self-reflexivity in the way that no wire, cable, or antenna ever could. Pigeons can also differentiate in the sense of making nuanced and generous distinctions. They can differentiate between people, between works of art, between buildings, and obviously between different kinds of territory. What these abilities highlight is pigeons grasp for place and displacement, for orientation and disorientation. So a data packet, for example, may rely on recognizing its addressees, and certainly virtual communication can seem awe-inspiring, but its mode of travel does not possess the intelligence, flexibility, and locative abilities in the same way that a pigeon might. So pigeons' ability to remember through their map and compass ability means that they are competent agents who render each other and human beings capable of situated social, ecological, behavioral, and cognitive practices. In terms of the research that's been done about pigeon flocks and the power dynamics of pigeon flocks, it's revealed that pigeons have very adaptive consequences of collective decision-making. And, 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 and so demonstrate what you might think of as sort of structural flexibility. Now, pigeons have a pretty stable hierarchical uh, sort of decision-making structure when they're flying. But whenever they're, confronted in a, whenever they're confronted in a situation where the performance of the whole flock is either in danger or would, be, or would suffer, they're able to sort of demonstrate this kind of flexibility in that they automatically rearrange positions and they prevent any errors or any mistakes or any, or, or any um, failures, if you want, from happening by sort of pushing the leaders or, or propagating them kind of down the hierarchy. In other words, pigeons recognize their own and one another's strengths and weaknesses within the larger collaborative network that they exist in, and they do so on the fly. Um, this capacity is really equal to communicating one's questions and needs and moving forward together. And again, I don't think I've ever heard of an ISDN, fiber optic, Wi-Fi, or even 5G network that can do this. But this kind of structural flexibility is central to how we might define a, um, a healthy, robust communication network that is made up of actually intelligent nodes. So a prototype such as the IPN then would benefit from its component parts, the pigeons, to be sensitive and aware of positionality, orientation, and navigation, while the arrangement of, as a whole, the pigeon flock, would illustrate a place-based, flexible, and smart mode of being. The pigeon loft or the pigeon tower serves a kind of different role. It gestures instead towards the possibility 
of co-creation between pigeons, humans, and the environment. Pigeons are, of course, perfectly capable of finding food and shelter by themselves. And so a pigeon loft may make it easier, but it doesn't actually actively change pigeons' lives. Instead, lofts and towers allow for the potential of a new encounter, giving the pigeon a dedicated space. In short, the pigeon would become present and visible in a different way than it is now. The loft and the tower would bring the pigeon into human view, provide the pigeon a space within the wider landscape. It would be an outcome of a co-labor and co-care between pigeon and human. The built tower or loft or coop becomes embedded in the urban fabric, which is itself an outcome, which would itself be an outcome of human animal technological urban co-architecture and thus constitute a component in a cohabitation arrangement, a kind of multi-species getting on together as Haraway uh, might call it. Um, the environment, the humans, access to the internet would not be damaged by these lofts. The pigeon is not damaged in any way by the installation and use of the lofts. All of the interested parties might actually be served. The pigeons receive healthy sustenance and shelter. The cityscape is unfettered, perhaps even beautified by it. City dwellers are unbothered by the effects and in fact might gain from something like a pigeon tower. Um, you'll see how this all kind of fits together, hopefully, <laughs> by the time I get to the end. But I'm going to move to uh, speaking specifically about Gaza and the IPN. So the Gaza Strip is really a, um, sorry, the Gaza Strip is really a created territory. It's an outcome of the 1948 war that led to the creation of the State of Israel. And since then, it has been rendered into this strip of land which over the past 30 years has been increasingly sealed and enclosed and subject to economic de-development and socio-political enclosure. It's also been under an oppressive siege since 2006, which has been followed by a series of brutal bombing campaigns in 2009, 2011, 2014, and most recently in 2021. The difficulty of everyday life in Gaza cannot be stressed enough. Circumcised, circumscribed uh, by stringent Israeli policies and limitations on movement of people, of capital, of materials, as well as Israeli control over land, air, and sea space. Infrastructurally, then, the Gaza Strip is destitute. Materials are forbidden, whether, the, whether those materials are for building, for sewage, for healthcare, education, or food or otherwise infrastructures are also, or, or materials and infrastructures are completely dependent on Israeli networks, such as electricity and communications. And then even so in very limited ways. Electricity is only available for a few hours a day. Untreated sewage flows in the streets, roads are unpaved. Schools lack walls and roofs. Waste management just really takes the form of burning garbage. So Palestinians are faced with these kind of unenviable questions or equations maybe. Which warrants investment, a hospital or a sewage system? Which warrants repair, one's home or one's school? So to navigate such impediments, alternatives or sort of do-it-yourself DIY solutions maybe is what we would call them here, are the norm. So smuggling tunnels are used to import everything from food to medicines, and animals to car parts, computers, construction materials, and, and so much more. Power generators for homes, hospitals, and stores um, are often rigged to run on cooking oil. Rubble from destroyed buildings are recycled as construction materials. Horses, donkeys, and rickshaws are used as primary modes of hauling and transportation. Any infrastructural development must take into account that Gaza struggles in a state of extreme and primarily externally imposed dysfunctionality. So this condition inevitably forces creativity. Everyone is compelled to make do, to circumvent, to hack, to rig, to recycle, to improvise. But Gaza is a real and also an extreme condition where infrastructural possibilities must be reimagined. But perhaps because it is so, it can also serve as a model of what might be possible universally. So all electronic communication is under the complete control of Israel, who has the sole power to uh, basically do everything uh, insofar as infrastructure is concerned, allocate spectrum, connect landlines and cables, 
um, determine bandwidth, survey content, as well as the power to sort of shut all of that down or destroy it, but at the same time also make a, a, a substantial profit off of that. Gaza lives under what I've elsewhere called uh, a regime of digital occupation. So I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I'm happy to in Q&A if you need to. But just to sort of understand that this is the context within which um, Gaza kind of survives. Um, in Gaza, connection is only available and permitted through Israel. So consumers, yes, they can subscribe to local Palestinian providers. But every one of these providers must itself purchase access from commercial Israeli providers who then purchase larger connection or, or, or who then purchase connection from even larger providers connected to the backbone uh, landing points across Israel's coastline. Any terrestrial or underwater connection through neighboring Egypt or Jordan is forbidden. Um, there is no connection, uh, again, whether via air or underground or on ground with the West Bank or underwater through Cyprus or anywhere else. So not only is it sort of contained, but obviously any kind of thinking of how else could you possibly set up an internet infrastructure would also just be uh, both prohibitively expensive, but also continuously sort of uh, put down by um, the Israeli state. And so the immediate challenges of an IPN really address a number, or the immediate uh, benefits, sorry, of, a, of the IPN really address a number of challenges that are faced in Gaza. And so recommends this kind of blueprint towards a reliable and, and high speed transfers, or high transfer speed, sorry, towards operational sustainability and affordability. Uh, uh, an imperviousness to interception and surveillance towards decreased dependence on and cost of technologies of expertise and contingent uh, infrastructure such as electricity, um, as well as uh, tries to ensure minimum interference control and profit by Israeli and foreign firms. So circumventing Israel's infrastructural grid is really a political and economic choice. So it's not just simply a flight of fancy. Um, so through the IPN, pigeons would replace and when necessary work alongside these kind of last mile and middlemen suppliers with the goal of direct and affordable access to backbone providers in Jordan and Egypt. Multiple nodes inside Gaza and neighbor uh, would exist inside, inside the Gaza Strip, as well as in neighboring Jordan and Egypt, connected via homing pigeons, which would carry lightweight micro memory cards to send and receive data. In order to ensure redundancy and protect against interruption or loss, the same data would be sent and received to at least two different nodes in the network by separate sets of pigeons. This is of course an asynchronous and delay tolerant network, but given the dismal electricity network in Gaza, this is already the case, so that there is hardly ever any kind of uh, continuous or fast speed uh, sort of internet service as it is. But nonetheless, the pigeon would actually provide a substantially faster download upload speed, which is really the pigeons flying in and out, than currently available and, and do so at, the, at a fraction of the costs. So the IPN would have these nodes, these kind of pigeon lofts to fly in and out of that would be located throughout the Gaza Strip and also externally in, um, in Jordan and Aqaba and then in Egypt in Suez, Safarna and Alexandria. And the reason I choose those is because these are where fiber optic landing points for the internet actually um, exist in, in the region. Smaller points would be like pigeon feeding stations would also be necessarily uh, would also be necessarily a, a, along the route along the Mediterranean or along the Sinai. Um, and part of the reason that I've also sort of uh, imagined it like this is because I've learned that pigeons do not like to fly over water. So I've had to sort of figure out what are the best overland ways of, of trying to uh, get to some place. So based on conservative calculations, it takes a pigeon about three hours to get from Gaza to Aqaba, and obviously another you know, three hours to come back. As an effective transfer rate, the IPN proves to be quick and reliable. So imagine a pigeon is carrying just one 64 gig drive from a micro drive, right, from Gaza to Suez at a rate of 100 kilometers an hour. The resulting speed would be an, an effective 69 megabits per second, which of course does not account for the time to copy the data, attach the drive to the pigeon, detach it and download the data. 
But for a pigeon, a pigeon carrying three memory sticks, the rate would be 207 megabits per second. A pigeon carrying five increases the rate to 345. So even with these relatively moderate calculations, and the moderate calculations here are in terms of like how much can a pigeon carry, how fast can a pigeon, can a pigeon fly, and even how far can a pigeon fly. But so based on those calculations, um, even just one data load, two pigeons sent to two different nodes, is faster than any internet speed currently available in Gaza and even many parts of the world. So what is lost in immediacy and synchronicity and in newness, if you want, is gained in economic, political, operational, and ecological sustainability. All infrastructures, of course, create opportunities and limits, promoting some interests at the expense of others. So rearing and training pigeons, building lofts with locally available or recycled materials, purchasing micro USB cards are cost effective, but they're also not dependent on electricity for data transfer, nor payment to Israeli providers. So at the same time, though, the network can kind of organically grow, right? So the, the um, one could increase the number of pigeons and lofts. One could agree on regularly accessing like every hour, every day, preemptively uh, saving data, for example, of different news sites, uh, videos, emails, and so on. And otherwise sort of imagining ways of scaling up or making the network more robust that would ultimately be determined and managed locally as opposed to uh, from others. Um, Relying on pigeons rather than cables, wires, modems, routers, antennas, electricity, and the like, not to mention the transportation of these materials uh, and the dependence on foreign experts to license and install these, the IPN would do away with a great deal of machinery of cost and excess. The pigeons and the pigeon lofts would be integral uh, parts of a kind of closed looped paradigm, if you want. The lofts, the coops, and the towers could be built from recycled uh, materials. Once built, they could double as public installations, as art, as playground extensions, and so on. Pigeon feathers would be used in crafts, toys, cleaning supplies, even in fashion. The high nitrogen content of pigeon poop would make an excellent and robust and free fertilizer. Pigeons also eat different types of insects and worms and would thereby keep the environment safe and the ecosystem in balance. And finally, older pigeons would eventually be consumed as protein rich meals, which is actually pretty common in that part of the world. But beyond the technical and economic advantages, the IPN offers local benefit, the, the IPN's local benefits reverberate to new employment opportunities, to development of new businesses, and so on. So the network, for example, could spur local data centers or a local internet exchange, the creation of local software-based open source programs. Tech groups and firms could develop their own research engines and softwares or a local private network requiring no cost or upkeep by at least external entities. Vets, loft architects, designers could emerge and create their own sort of offshoot industries. New eco conservation groups, research and education programs into the birds, flora and fauna of Gaza would emerge. Situated at the nexus of three continents, Gaza's coastal wetland is actually a major stopping point along a migratory superhighway between Europe, Western Asia, and Africa for about 500 million birds every year. The Gaza Strip's various ecosystems are also home to over 500 kinds of avifaunal species, including seven species of pigeons. The utility of pigeons for long distance communication is arguably the earliest and longest lasting means of distributing and circulating messages over large territorial reaches and doing so pretty speedily. The pigeon post, which by many accounts originated in the Middle East, remained the fastest communication system across the world until the invention of the telegraph and radio. Well into the 18th century, pigeon posts were prevalent as the primary means of long distance communications in the areas of today's uh, or modern day Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, within which Gaza was actually a critical node. Albeit largely displaced by newer technologies, homing pigeons ease of traversing variegated and wide geographies, their astounding reliability and their ability to carry small items rendered them, renders them useful until this day. 
One study, for example, has contemplated providing internet access through homing pigeons in developing countries when there are no other kind of connectivity options. The researchers who propose this, I can never say it, but it's Columba Livia based delay tolerant network, otherwise known as COLI DTN. Um, they suggest that it is quite conceivable that COLI DTN will in fact be competitive against DSL, ISDN, and point-to-point -point Wi Fi connections in a, in, in a number of different settings. Indeed, also in South Africa, for example, one experiment proved that the speed of a pigeon delivery was markedly faster than the local internet providers. The IPN, however, is not imagined as an experiment to prove how slow a provider's connection is, and more importantly, is not imagined as a solution that can work only for poor areas or in exceptional circumstances. Instead, I think the IPN can echo examples across the world where animals and alternative technologies are used for eliminating middlemen, for increasing profits over distance, or minimally harming the environment. In a sense, they're kind of it's kind of like a kind of a counter logistics that opens up new geography, new geographies of circulatory politics. It puts also into question uh, the assumption that more complex devices are necessary, better, or faster. Um, and the and uh, the consideration really of the sort of feasibility, efficiency, or scalability of any communication network should be useful everywhere and not just simply in, in this case, in the case of Gaza. Um, I hope I'm still okay on time. Yes, you're fine. Okay, cool. Um, so pigeons, like all humans and animals, map territories, contract forces, fold their bodies and establish relations. Through movement, animals define themselves and define space and time as their own. What constitutes animality is the faculty and the power of converting energy into action, of the ability to move and the ability to decide when to move. As Henry Bueller states it quite simply, in movement, there is life. Movement is a way of bridging also the human and non-human divide. Animals often make themselves known to humans through movement, kind of traveling in and out of our human frame. And across history, it's really been principally through movement that animals have been seen <clears throat> by humans to have agency. Consider, for example, how, you know, when we think of uh, domestic domestication of animals as an opposition to being wild and free, domestication really is an act of corralling of enclosing and denying free movement to animals. And similarly, it's also the human imposed lack of free movement over animals that is often some that often symbolizes cruel practices. So movement is really function and agency. It's constantly changing and never fixed. If movement describes a shift in spatial coordinates, mobility refers to the politics and ethics of movement and stillness. The conceptual shift from movement to mobility recognizes that animal movements are always produced within and are productive of relations of power between different actors, but also equally how they gain meaning. Um, Iris Braverman, for example, advances the concept of animobilities to denote an animal's physical actancy within complex socio-geographies. She explains, when animal and human trajectories collide in the built environment, to the extent that animals cannot be tamed or controlled, there is an underlying existential human experience of social disorder. The capacity of flight makes the pigeon a particularly effective transgressor. While we have legislated spaces for these birds out of existence, we cannot put up fences or easily set traps to limit their animobilities. They can freely move across state and national borders. So the fact that birds can fly and do so freely across any imposed political borders obviously makes them that much more symbolic in the context of politically imposed closure and immobility such as Gaza's. But animals exist in trans and supranational spaces, and any efforts to control them have actually historically been connected to colonialism and the projects of nation states, in part because animals have meant both literal mobility and social mobility, the control of animals has been a way for states to control the movement of people, sometimes literally 
limiting them to reserves, such as in the context of South Africa. So it should also come as no surprise that animals have remained a strategy of mobility, particularly among those marginalized within the nation state. So human animal entanglements, in a sense, can be subversive. They could illuminate the ways that non-humans, particularly when they're recruited by humans, can challenge border regimes across time and space. Pigeons can fly from A to B, but they can also be retrained to fly from C to D. So their mobility is nonlinear. They have a flexible behavior in their flight paths, in the distances they travel, in the foraging strategies, but also in the timing of their activities. So pigeons' atmospheric geometries are quite complex. They're converging as flexible. Their worldling, to uh, echo Haraway again, is expansive. So pigeons really are a means of expansion, of continuation, of traversing and creating spaces. Their movement and mobility is a process of interrelation. Perhaps this is something that we would elsewhere call communication. As data carriers, pigeons can extend humans' inability to overcome the friction of distance and time. As a network, they expand the opportunities of human interaction with other humans, but also with non-human beings and the whole ecosystem. As such, pigeons and their networks are capable of and demonstrate something much more than some something much more than just uncontrollable mobility, but can pose a challenge to colonizing powers. Um, the internet pigeon network is really a blueprint for solving problems that, yes, are unique to Gaza, but it is equally a prototype that can work in cities and rural areas and farms, rich or poor, dense or sparse, whether these are hard to reach or accessible for humans, because pigeons can access them, across state lands, natural parks, and so on. Um, the IPN, I think, could also appeal to off-the-gridders and others that are conscientious of cost and surveillance or the extraordinary amount of energy and resources that internet traffic uses. It's a model of an intelligible infrastructure that maximizes efficiencies by decreasing the network's dependence and complexity. And by so doing, it replaces agency in the communities that it serves. The IPN, as a thought exercise, contemplates how an open and participatory form of infrastructure building and imagining can enable new sociopolitical forms of association, building on what Alberto Jimenez calls the right to infrastructure, within which the notion of a prototype is really central. As he describes it, the right to infrastructure allows us to escape allows us to escape the human, non-human, and epistemology ontology dichotomies altogether by opening up the agential work of infrastructures as a source and open source of possibilities in their own right. Central to this idea, uh, I, can't, I can't read my screen, sorry, hold on. Um, central to this idea of open source urban hardware projects as expressive of a right to infrastructure is their status as prototypes. So infrastructure is not something that is added to the social or that simply kind of inflects it, but, re but really it's something that becomes reinscribed as a constitutive right, the right to define and redefine one's infrastructural being. And that infrastructural being is what is the prototype. So prototypes of course make visible the problematic and excessive ways that our lives are regulated by the design of technical systems. They can help us question the contingent nature of modern life. By revealing the relationship between design, infrastructure, and political authority, for example, the IPN exposes and challenges what we might think of as the radical monopoly of existing infrastructure. The Internet Pigeon Network challenges also our perceived need for ever increasingly complex and expensive systems. It foregrounds existing technologies impact on animal and ecological balances and proposes that local communities reclaim operations that shape the political, economic and ecological systems that underlie our technologies. Prototypes such as the IPN represent possible systemic change that are wrought by a different network architecture in order for individuals and communities to have the capacity to challenge, or in some cases at least bypass, parts of the current political, economic, and socio-technical regimes. Um, the point of IPN is not simply uh, to be built, but really to be conscious and critical of the constraints of the socio-technical regime. 
The, IPN, the IPN's aim is not to think across various industrial systems per se. So it's not about, oh, how do we bring together water infrastructures and energy and agriculture and communication and animals and urban life and so on. But it's really about traversing and transcending those human needs, those infrastructural designs, animal rights and environmental sustainability. So even if the IPN proves incapable of initiating such, such systemic change, its contribution is hopefully in revealing possibilities for different infrastructural efficiencies, for collective and community-based values, for civic, political, and economic functions, and ecological coexistence. It is, in other words, in every sense, a prototype it never quite reaches closure. It keeps forking and enabling novel extensions to itself. So a pigeon internet infrastructure prototype is in other words, a speculative process that leads us towards unimagined ends. This in and of itself actually harkens back to a definition of an organic infrastructure by arguably the two largest sort of infrastructure studies uh, scholars who state the competing requirements of openness and malleability, coupled with structure and navigability, create a fascinating design challenge, even a new science. The emergence of infrastructure, the when of complete transparency, is thus an organic one, evolving in response to the community evolution and adoption of infrastructure as natural, involving new forms and conventions that we cannot yet imagine. So the goal of imagining new infrastructural arrangements, again, is not about what it takes to survive amidst inevitable decline or life in capitalist ruins, nor is it a proposal to simply return to old technologies as some kind of Luddite move. Instead, it's suggesting that we recognize that our networks can incorporate a wide range of species relationships or entangled assemblages. It's also calling to reconceive of our communication networks and all infrastructures for that matter as organic. But more than that, it's also to recognize the extent to which we already live in a multi-species world that is networked. One that of course generates different and inequitable relations, circumstances and experiences amongst those, all those who are involved. Our communication networks do not emerge, of course, or take place against a neutral substate, substrate, but neither does the IPN. The IPN, however, would demonstrate that the substrate itself is active, lively, fragile, powerful, and connected. So while our collective futures depend on how we redistribute our resources, how we reimagine our place, how we reconfigure our concept of growth, and how we reconstitute our organization, the organization of our society, and how we re, and how we regenerate our entanglement with nature. The IPN then could be a co-constitutive prototype within which we can act and think with the world rather than against it, leading us towards a kind of infrastructural ecology. And that it would be established in Gaza as a means of constituting relationality and outcome of connecting relations of expanding communication, the internet pigeon network is perhaps really just a prototype of life. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I don't know if I should leave the sources up or if I should just kind of show myself, but I, maybe I can just sort of share the sources if anybody's interested. Um, I think you can I leave them up for a minute or two oh, and then fine. yes, feel free to um, <clears throat> feel free to um, share them if you have that easily available. And if not, we can make it available afterwards. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you so yeah. much. This is really an amazing conversation. And I'll just remind people you can enter questions in the Q&A box. We already have um, a couple of questions and um, I'll, I'll get us started on on that. And um, I think if you want to um, uh, take, uh, I'll read you the question. And then if you want to take down, um, yeah, perfect. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to see what's going on. <laughs> so this is, um, so this is a question that says, I would love to hear more about what it means for Gaza to live under a regime of digital occupation. 
I'm considering how the concept of digital occupation can relate to the concept of achieving digital, digital sovereignty, which has been a framework some have utilized in critical indigenous studies. That's a great question. Um, I guess the way that I've that I've kind of conceived of uh, digital occupation, I kind of mean it as a sort of multifold uh, sort of process. So on the one hand, it's it's making us aware of of the po mostly political, but obviously political translated into economic, technical, and other kinds of constraints that are imposed from the outside. But digital occupation is also, um, in my mind, I mean, I I don't get into this here, but in my mind, it's also about how um, the those who are in charge of the system themselves, in this case, like the Palestinian Authority, pursue a path that is often about profit, as opposed to seeing um, the infrastructure as something that is uh, available for the public. Instead, they kind of approach it as this sort of in, like economically, literally enclosed space from which to make profit, from which surveillance is possible and so on. So I think of digital occupation as like a number of different things that are sort of coming together to make this landscape, um, I guess I think of it as enclosed. Um, so that's that's sort of, I think how I generally sort of conceive of digital occupation in terms of the relationship to, um, uh, to digital, oh, sorry. <laughs> In terms of the relationship to uh, digi digital, I can't even speak anymore, um, sovereignty, um, I think what maybe digital occupation can highlight is like all of those different aspects, right? So all of those different points, all of the different nodes, not just simply in the network, but so it's external control, it's economic uh, controls, it's the developmental sort of mind frame of how do we build or how do we maintain an infrastructure. Um, it's also about questions of who owns it and who gets to build it and where is it that it's allowed to um, exist and so on. So I don't know if that's that's kind of what, what the question was getting, getting, getting to, but that's sort of how I, I'm uh, interpreting it at least. Great. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I think you, you started from a point that surprised me, which was talking about the, the human animal ecological relationships, as opposed to thinking about, you know, pigeons as an old communication technology. So I'm curious as to how you, how you started thinking in a sense about the, the um, IPN at all, how, how this was created in, in your imagination. Because I think what you're talking about so much is about just expanding imagination that's <laughs> beyond typical boundaries. All right. Yeah, so I guess, again, I just wanted to want to thank you for listening to me, right? Because I feel like this is the first time I make this public in a way, right? Um, so I'm, I am curious to see if, if it feels like it gels, right? And, and whether you, you know, you and anybody else, whether you kind of had critiques of, well, but wait, why did you start with that as opposed to something else, right? So, I mean, you know, so I'm, I'd be really curious for that. Um, the idea for the IPN really started as, um, you know, I was invited to write this chapter for this book that just came out uh, called Open Gaza. And it was this challenge, and it was mostly like architects and urban planners whom I have uh, great um, reverence to, I guess. But it was a group of them who were like, well, how could we imagine Gaza as this sort of self-sustaining entity? And at first, I did not want to partake in the project because I was like, well, but if we think of Gaza as itself separate from the rest that's already the problem right so that you know gaza is has always been a, an inextricable part of palestine or sort of palestinian identity and so on um and you know i had obviously previously written about internet and internet infrastructures and i kind of just sort of said it as a joke at the very beginning i'm like oh well what if we just sort of think of you know like the internet as something that we can do or you know communication that we can do by pigeons and of course this this speaks to a really long history right of the pigeon posts and the pigeons in world war 2 and i think all of us have kind of heard of this like we all know about uh pigeons as messengers so 
rather than go down that path though, I really started getting into the details of, okay, well, how do you train a pigeon? How much does a pigeon cost? Where does a pigeon need to live? Can a pigeon carry something? How much can it carry? What are the different kind of micro drives that are available that you could easily already, you have to sort of smuggle stuff in to begin with, right? So, you know, I was sort of trying to think of like, well, what are all the different possible ways that you could do this? And at the same time, I was really, um, I was really trying to think of what are all the ways that Gaza could be connected to the internet, right? So, okay, well, maybe they could, I don't know, uh, launch a balloon, right? But a balloon would easily be shot down. Maybe they could build their own underwater cable to connect to Cyprus, but that, you know, I don't know, that costs like $50 million or something, and there's just no money for that. So all of the ideas that I kept coming up with, I just sort of kept hitting very sort of clear limits. And I'm not saying that there are no limits to the pigeons, of course there are, but when I discovered also that Gaza is really this kind of important node on the sort of... Uh, bird super highway I was like oh the pigeons could be camouflaged and you know no one's going to shoot down the pigeons and with the rest of the birds that are migrating so in a sense it kind of started as a joke but it just sort of started to take a, a life of its own right um and through that it's just sort of forced me to think about um yeah questions that I never had imagined right so about animals um about uh different kinds of mobilities and so on so it, i don't know it's it's been really fun i don't really know what i'm going to do with all of this stuff um so it's it's part paper it's part a piece of art that i'm trying to make um so yeah i'm just sort of really curious to see how how people respond to it um well as my dog barks in the background <laughs> The Zoom Plus. So I think that actually ties to sort of another concept, which says I'm really interested in your use of the speculative as a method for reshaping an aspect of everyday life. Could you talk more about how you develop this method in your work and what it affords you that more traditional methods possibly don't? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's there are certain things that I arrived to kind of um, at the end, right? So it sort of occurred to me that this is really, uh, this is a speculation. It, I didn't, I feel like I didn't necessarily start off with thinking about it as a speculative moment or a speculative thing, but more I felt like I kind of arrived at that. And as I started like digging around and reading, I was like, oh, there's this whole thing. Uh, about uh, speculative methods and so on. So I feel like I've kind of gotten there in a somewhat a, a roundabout way. Um, um, but I think part of what it does is, is it precisely, it's not just simply about making connections between what might seem kind of strange fields or different disciplines, but it's precisely sort of how do we go beyond just sort of thinking of them as somehow connections, but how do they uh, begin to inform each other. And I think only if you allow yourself this kind of speculation or jokeness or, or however you kind of want to think about it, um, only if you allow yourself that, I think, can you kind of get to those types of, of, of questions. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> the fan club is weighing in. Cool concept and great presentation. And you mentioned a proposed pigeon network. And I'm going to actually have you look at the Q&A box, uh, okay, uh, yeah. the second one down, just in case I'm getting the um, uh, abbreviation right. wrong, okay. DCI-TN. Did the researchers who proposed it give it a try? And if so, how did their experiment turn out? Um, so there have been a couple of, of, um, of experiments that have, uh, that have run, right? So for example, the the South Africa proving the proving that the telecom providers uh, internet speed was slower was actually done with a pigeon. Um, in terms of the Kali DTN um, uh, research, I don't think they actually ever played it out, but there have been others that have tried something similar. I mean, I don't think anyone's necessarily been thinking about, oh, do we carry um, do we carry uh, micro cards and so on? I mean, I think a lot of it tends to be thought of in these in these kind of very exceptional moments, right? Of like, well, how could we bring 
um, how could we bring messages to far off places like in Alaska or someplace? Right? So it's, it's, often, it's, it's often thought of as when there is no other possibility, right? But for me, I really wanted to sort of try to think of that in the reverse of not what, when is there no other possibility. It's not about uh, sort of making do with less, but is it that, you know, something like the pigeon network, right? Again, as a kind of idea, can it force us to rethink how, how we imagine um, our, our networks? Thanks. Um, again, somebody agreeing that this is such a, ri a rich talk. And, and the question is, the IPM prototype you imagine and theorize here affords powerful possibilities for, Palis um, for Palestinian liberation in general and the empowerment of besieged Gazans in, partic in particular. You note the capacity of pigeons to evade middlemen and thereby to circumvent geopolitical powers that control and oppress the colonized. Have you given thought, however, to the potential vulnerability of pigeons to human interception and death dealing? Is it not possible for the Israeli military to shoot the messenger and thereby kill vital communications among Palestinians and between Palestinians and others across the region and the world? Or to capture the messenger and decode sensitive information from the memory cards it carries? Right. So in terms of the practicality of the IPN, I guess maybe the first thing I will say is that there is there, there just is simply no foolproof way of doing this, right? By the by very definition, um, a network makes you susceptible to others, right? So you will always be uh, sort of open to surveillance or interception or, or halting your message or so on, right? So the very nature of a network automatically kind of opens that field for you. So that's one. Two is that, yes, of course, I mean, I think, you know, everything that Palestinians try, Israelis are going to try to literally shoot down, okay? But what I was thinking about was more, well, you know, if you shoot down, first of all, that's why you would have multiple pigeons going to multiple nodes so that they could kind of, you know, uh, get to different places. Of course, there's many sort of loopholes in this, and I recognize that, but um, oh, I just heard a lot, lost my train of thought. Um, but I think the idea for me was ultimately that, look, you know, shooting down pigeons and losing, you know, I'd calculated the costs, right, of like sort of beginning to set up the infrastructure would cost something like ten to $15,000, right? So losing that is obviously a hell of a lot easier than having your underwater fiber optic cable cut and then having to re rebuild that and pay another $50 million to someone. So in part, it's like a bit of, yes, it's, it's, it's kind of dealing with the absurdities that are imposed on Gazans and Palestinians in terms of it, it would take something as ridiculous as an internet pigeon network to perhaps bypass a lot of um, both um, sort of Israeli uh, controls, but also surveillance and also profit, right? So that's the other thing that I was kind of thinking about when I when I when I started dreaming up of this is how what would be the ways in which to kind of circumvent making sure that Israel doesn't uh, necessarily economically benefit uh, from this. So, but those are very practical questions, which there's, I mean, I have a lot of answers, but I also recognize that, well, but, you know, I mean, the messages can then be caught once, once they, once they get to Egypt and are sent through the normal internet, so. But I have to say, I think part of what you've really demonstrated here is the value of the, of the speculative for beginning to think out how, how would you answer those questions in a different way. And that ties in with someone else's comment here that says, you asked how this talk landed. For me, it was thought provoking and fascinating. I also loved what you said about the speculative method. So, um, and now, and now we'll go on to, to uh, questions, which is, um, first of all, thank you very much for this truly decolonial techno environmental imaginary with Gaza as anchor starting point and the center of hope. Second, two questions. First, 
How do you link your work to other scholarship and instances of militarization of human animal relations, starting with say police dogs or fighting horses? How do you see IPN as an alternative to this militarization? And I'll go ahead and read the second question. How do you see your work about the IPN connecting to other decolonial forms of transformative future imaginaries away from the Western and Eurocentric ownership of so-called sustainable futures? Um, those are great questions. Thank you, Adi. Um, I hadn't, I had never even thought of animals in, in relationship to militarization. I was thinking. I was thinking more of, you know, in the case of Israel Palestine, what you have is a, is a very strict limitation on animals, right? So, um, you know, vaccines are not allowed, uh, animals are not allowed to graze in certain places. So I was thinking about it more of like, well, what kind of animal could possibly sort of try to circumvent some of these, some of these uh, different limitations? But you're right in that animals are, are often kind of used uh, as a violent infrastructure, if I can call it that, right? Or as a sort of colonial or, or police uh, sort of infrastructure. So I hadn't really thought about that, um, but that's a great, I'm gonna have to think about it. Um, so thanks for that. Um, and I the second part of that oh, question yeah. is how, you, how do you see your work about the, um, about the IPN connecting to other decolonial forms of transformative future imaginaries away from the Western and Eurocentric ownership of sustainable futures. Um, so given that the, the that my own ideas for the IPN project started with this group of like architects and urban planners, I have to, maybe I have to sort of like make a plug for, for the book that came out, but I found that, you know, every, not everybody, but a lot of the projects in that book began to actually try to think both practically of, okay, let's build a solution for electricity, for water, for sewage, for communications, whatever. But also let's try to sort of challenge particular ways of thinking. And so I think that um, I, I found that there was a sort of connection obviously to be made with a lot of the scholarship uh, in that. So that book is just called Open Gaza. And I, and I would um, obviously sort of recommend it. Like it's just, a, a, I don't know. It's a really informative and fun read. But it also trying to, tries to reconceptualize, like, well, what is urban planning and what is a building and how might you go about doing it? And, and how could you sort of build literally from the ground up, right? So in terms of um, defining things locally as opposed to by any sort of standards that are um, externally imposed. And I think part of the thing about pigeons is that, you know, the more I learn about pigeons, the more I kind of realized, well, they're still really popular in places like Lebanon and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but also in places like Gaza. So they've never really gone away. While well, they may have been displaced by telegraphs and telephones and radio and so on, they're actually still, um, a, a, you know, a relatively common uh, as in terms of like as messengers, right, or as, as racing pigeons, it's actually still pretty common in that part of the world in the way that it isn't necessarily here. Um, so I think part of it kind of just sort of speaks to, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of local flavors or, or local tastes. Um, I, I'm just going to interject a quick question out of selfishness. The fact that pigeons in so many cities are feral descendants, how, how does that affect their animal abilities, so to speak? Hmm. I don't know, what do you mean? Well, I just was interested that you described them as feral and, and I would think of the competitors in Western uh, perceptions of obnoxious urban animals to be squirrels. But, uh, you know, so does, I mean, pigeons really are these amazing, you know, animals with amazing abilities. And, and so I was just wondering whether characterizing them as, as feral represented some corruption of those abilities or something. Right. Like that. Yeah, I don't know. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about pigeons and, you know, maybe squirrels is, is somewhat similar, certainly I don't know, I live in New York City, so I was gonna say cockroaches and rats for sure. Yeah. But you know, they are the way that they are um, 
because of the interactions that we've had with them over centuries and millennia, right? So, you know, I mean, a pigeon has learned to sort of deal um, with, you know, the urban environment in a way that it was never really meant to. So I think part of it is also maybe to sort of think of, of a kind of mobility over time, but also, or maybe it's more of a flexibility in terms mm -hmm. of their habits. So I think that's also what makes uh, pigeons kind of, for me at least sort of really interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, well, you, we have another, uh, we have two um, comments uh, and engagements, shall I say. Okay. Thank you for a fantastic talk. The context and framework is different, but I wanted to call your attention in case you don't know it already, um, to a project by the artist Heba or Heba Amin titled The General Stork about birds, technology, surveillance, and colonialism. And quoting from her, her website, in 2013, Egyptian authorities detained a migratory stork traveling from Hungary through Israel into Egypt because an, of an electronic device attached to its back. It was suspected of espionage. Almost 100 years earlier, Lord Allenby, the British High Commissioner in Cairo, completed a major phase in biblical prophecy by launching bird-like machines to capture Jerusalem from the Ottomans. The General Stork explores historical accounts of biblical prophecies, colonial narratives, and the politics of technological warfare from the bird's eye view. It questions the contemporary condition of our paranoia that leads us to fear our skies and in in turn, accuse a migrating bird of being an international spy. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I only very recently discovered um, her work. Uh, so I'm curious to sort of like engage with it more. It's also been it's also been sort of fascinating to see um, that there's been like increasing moves to ban uh, pigeons and birds. Like, so I was really surprised to find out that like ISIS had uh, banned messenger pigeons in Syria. It's like, wow, so people really do use these things, right? Um, but so I, I think it's, and it's often, I think in the realm of art, right? And particularly where art kind of meets, um, I don't wanna necessarily say science, right? But whether where it's art meets urban culture, art meets the city, art meets um, animals and so on. I feel like that's often where some of the most interesting things end up happening. And it's also in that realm, I think where the relationship of human to pigeon is perhaps the most, um, I don't know what you wanna call it, kind of like progressive or alternative or maybe even decolonial. So thank you. That's really fascinating. And uh, we have another comment rather than a question. Since you asked, I seldom feel a sense of delight when listening to an academic talk. I won't identify this person, but your topic and approach to it are really delightful. The direct comparison of pigeons to non-living communications infrastructure, the consideration of how pigeon infrastructure can serve the community in multiple practical ways and so on. I love this work perhaps because of your serious consideration of what seems on the face of it absurd. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's really sweet. Yeah, I mean, the, this is the thing is that sometimes I just not, I'm not quite sure what to tell people. Um, yes, I'm really into pigeons, but it's really not about the pigeons, right? It's about um, all sorts of, all, all sorts of um, the questions that, that it enables, you know, so thank you so much for that. Well, thank you. And um, we have, uh, we have another um, question and a few more minutes for questions. And also I'll just point people, if you want the links and references to the general stork, they've been entered in the chat. Oh, so, it's from, oh I just saw that, it's from Omar. Hi, Omar. <laughs> thank you, Omar. Um, so thank you for a fascinating and generative talk. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, but I appreciate your impulse to make Gaza not an exceptional space, but a space that can generate prototypes that are broadly applicable. I'm also curious if this idea could be extended to other birds. For, for instance, could larger birds carry letters or small packages? 
So better than Amazon drones. Right, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, yes, let's challenge Amazon um, all the way. I hadn't really thought of other birds. Um, you know, I just sort of, I, I think like, you know, pigeons in part because they're there. Um, pigeons are, you know, you don't even have to, I mean, I was trying to think of like the cheapest possible thing, right? And the most available thing and the most common in a way. Um, it's also kind of a well-known fact that in places like Egypt and Gaza, like, a, a, you know, there's actually like a pigeon dish. So people really enjoy eating pigeon. So for me, it was sort of like, that's kind of where it started. Otherwise I would have gone down the road of a chicken and I probably wouldn't have gotten very far with the chicken. But um, so I haven't really thought of, of other birds. I think there's a number of different works that look at different animals. So like the donkey, for example, is, is, has a really kind of long history uh, particularly in the context of Palestine. And so there's been like really interesting work that sort of looks at the donkey and, and its relationship to, you know, sort of like challenging um, space, challenging mobilities and so on. And obviously a donkey is not as invisible if you want um, as a bird and can't go in the same way, but, but there's a lot of these, there, there's in, you know, I mean, I guess I've discovered this whole sort of realm of, of I don't know, work and scholarship and art and so on that, uh, that deals with animals in these different um, spaces. Well, I think that relates to a common question um, that was put in the chat before. And it says, I love this network is, that this network is considered from the perspective of its role in and impact on the ecosystem. How could such forethought shift the impact of data centers for their local environments or communities? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And I feel like this is part of the thing of like, you know, Sort of uh, bringing forth a whole number of questions, right? Um, so I don't, I don't have an immediate answer to that. I feel like I have to sort of think about it. But that's a, yeah, right. a great question. <laughs> Are there other ecological infrastructure concepts you considered or came across as you worked with this idea? Have you spoken with engineers about how to oper operationalize such a, a network? Mm -hmm. Um, so I've I've come across a number of, of um, there are many different kinds of, I don't know what you want to call them, ecological infrastructures, animal infrastructures, and so on. Um, and so, you know, I think like there are, there are many interesting ones. So one of the ones that I found really fascinating is actually in Uganda, and it's the use of storks actually for waste management. Uh, and sort of garbage. So that that was kind of really interesting to me. But, you know, the, the thing about that was, um, you know, it really kind of utilizes the bird in a way as literally doing the dirty work that humans don't want to do, right? And I was trying to somehow uh, move beyond that. Or like here in, in the city, um, you know, there's a sort of like oyster cultivation down by the by the river so that Presumably with the next, uh, what do you call it? Not her, yeah, it was hurricane. Like when Hurricane Sandy happened or, you know, with uh, the rising uh, sea change that the the oysters themselves can actually help in terms of like the the height, the, the lowering and the, and the hiring of, of um, the water levels. So there's a number of the, like these different ways in which animals are actually used in a sense as infrastructural um, so there's, and, you know, you can even just think of something as simple as the donkey as, as a sort of, as a kind of infrastructure, right? Or as the mule. I mean, you can't, you know, I don't know, you can go down the Grand Canyon on a, on a donkey. You can cross desert or maybe not deserts, but jungles or something or the camels. But again, I think part of it is that, you know, well, how do we move beyond just thinking of the animal as something that is useful or something that we can use in terms of its labor? but to really, to go and to kind of coexist, but to also, um, you know, I almost want to say like kind of become hybrid with them, right? So pigeons have these abilities that we don't have. Um, and rather than sort of look to technologies, is there a way that we can kind of reconceive of something, in, in my case, a communication network to sort of build something um, completely different, right? So it's not just, Oh, let's protect. Uh, let's protect against uh, you know the mess that we are making, in which we're we're going to result with higher sea levels. 
but it's it's sort of trying to move uh, a step beyond that as well. Well, this has been pretty fantastic, and uh, we are reaching the end of our time. And I will just have to say, looking out my window, you have brought sunshine. To, oh, thanks! Almost sunshine to the Twin Cities. So. Uh, thank you so much. I am sure I speak for all the attendees in saying that this has been an incredibly stimulating and, and fun talk. And uh, we hope you'll come, come back again. And thanks uh, again for uh, meeting with the IAS Collaborative and, uh, and uh, students today and all of, the, all of the good things that you have brought to us. Great, thank you so much, and really thank you to everybody for like willing to listen listen to my uh, you know quasi absurd uh, stories. I really really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, totally fun for us. Thank you so much, and we'll see everybody else next week. Uh, I hope at for the spotlight series. <laughs>